So as, as we talk about Knox's emergence, and I talked about trying to find objective bases for his, um, his, his greatness, uh, and you certainly don't find it in numbers of mentions in periodic periodicals, We've got about seven or eight points here, and I'm going to come on back to the first one, but he did, in fact, influence uh, European design in 1900 to 1905. And Stephen Martin put it beautifully when he said, who wrote the book on, on Knox, uh, he said it could as well have been not Liberty style, but Knox style. But in fact, Southern Europe and Italy adopted the phrase for Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau Liberty style, in part because of the dramatic nature and features of Knox's designs. Coming on, and it's a microcosm, this, but 1912, Knox left um, the school he was teaching at in a bit of a strop. Um, I'll speak more about that. Um, but his pupils formed the Knox Guild of Design. They admired him that much, they formed the Knox Guild of Design. And this thing didn't just last one or two years. This survived till 1937. It put on um, uh, uh, exhibitions in of his work in prestigious galleries in the Whitechapel and supported exhibitions of, abroad of his art as well. Now, I think we've all had teachers we admire and mentor us and think are good, but not many people have set up a guild that lasts 25 years uh, after uh, someone has left, because that's how much they admired the man, as I say, a microcosm. 1917 is an interesting date. Arthur Lazenby died, and he uh, was the king of the period. I think you'd have to combine Versace, uh, I'll say in a British context at least, with Conran to imag imagine Lazenby's fa fame. Excuse me. He was, the, he was the kingmaker of Art Nouveau and avant-garde. He knew absolutely every designer globally, but the man chosen to make his, his gravestone was Knox. And Knox hadn't had anything to do with liberty at that time, probably for 10 years, maybe longer. But he went to Knox for the gravestone, and that, that does tell you something. Really, there's a complete hiatus, perhaps around the whole period, in fairness, not just around Knox. And then you come to the 60s, and of course, the Isle of Man has always recognized Knox as a great artist. And in 1964, they had a centenary exhibition. Uh, I, I wasn't there, it was a, must have been a fabulous thing, but I'll say akin to what we've done here with the metalwork. Um, and so you start to see him coming back to the fore. And around 1964, the V&A started to write academically about liberty in the Art Nouveau period, and they immediately identified Knox as one of their avant-garde designers. By the time you hit 1975, the V&A puts on this Liberty exhibition, the Centenary exhibition, and Knox is still really buried in that exhibition. If you go through that catalogue as I've done, he's about 10% of all the items in the exhibition. There are eight chapters, and he dominates two of them. And then the Liberty and Kumrick Silver and Pewter range dominates the introduction as well to that catalogue, and that's really Knox. So again, he's there, but a little bit in the shadows. By the 1990s, you really have Knox coming to the fore, and now you've got an, a, a designer who's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the V&A. And I did try and find out how many British artists or decorative artist designers are in those three museums, and I must say I lost confidence in my ability to research that accurately, so you haven't got the answer, but from my research, very, very few are in all three. And of course, Knox is in many, many other new museums as well. And finally, to talk about an objective measure of his success value, uh, his silver pieces now sell, his best silver pieces can sell in excess of 100,000 pounds, and that puts his silver on a par with the very best silver of any period in British history. So you really are talking someone at the top of their game now and recognized as such by the market.